All right. Well, good morning. So good to be with you this morning. I think it's finally uh, getting above the freezing uh, mark out there and a little bit, a uh, little icy in places this morning uh, when I got up, and I think that's about about to go away, but uh, I'm kind of ready for winter to go away. How about you? Uh, I'm ready for spring. I like to go in the greenhouse on sunny days and pretend uh, it's 72 in there and it's green, so I feel like that's a good good thing. The Lord's really good to us, and uh, He's given us a beautiful place and a nice warm place, a uh, comfortable place to be uh, this morning. We are continuing in our series of messages following Jesus from Christmas to the cross, and uh, this morning we've been talking about the temple and, and we've been talking about um, the law, and last week we uh, kind of dove into that, and just want to kind of go back and just kind of, uh, if you if this maybe is your first time here in a while, uh, just to give you a little review and kind of catch you up to where we were. We started out uh, in this uh, message series on the banks of the Jordan River when uh, John the Baptist uh, presented and announced to the world, uh, here he is, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And immediately uh, following the baptism of Jesus, we followed him into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan and uh, where we begin to see uh, what his uh, uh, understanding and, 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 and begin to understand what his purpose was going to be uh, in his time on this earth. We followed him out of the wilderness back to the banks of the Sea of Galilee and it was in that place and in that story where Peter came face to face with who he began to realize was truly uh, God. And uh, in the miraculous catch of fish, uh, Peter was willing and understood enough at that point that he needed to leave everything and follow uh, Jesus. And from there last week, uh, we followed Jesus up to the Sermon on the Mount when he began to teach and he began, and the thing about uh, that we, we, we uh, understood last week is that the content of the Sermon on the Mount was most likely not delivered only once. It was not one of those things like, Matthew, you better write this down because this is the only time he's going to say this. This was stuff that he taught regularly. Okay, Jesus, wherever he went, he drew crowds. He taught in synagogues. He taught in lots of places. And, and whenever he would draw a crowd, whenever he would teach, most likely these were some of the things that he taught. And, and, and we looked at some of the content, and we didn't really look specifically verse by verse, but we looked at a lot of the content of that message and what we discovered as we looked at that was many times uh, throughout that that message Jesus would say something like this you have heard that it was said long ago okay that it was taught to the people and, and what he was talking about was Moses he was talking about Moses he was talking about the law you've heard that it was said long ago but I say what you mean you are telling us to, are you you know, because the, the teachers of the law would teach the law. And, and then they would say, this is what the law says, and this is how you follow the law. But Jesus said, this is what you have heard. This is the way you've heard it taught. But I tell you this. And he would add to and, and, and increase the understanding of those things. And, 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 and the Bible says that he, he, he made the statement in the process of that teaching that I haven't come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. There was more there. There was more understanding. It was almost like the, it, when, when the law was given, it was like we really, really messed it up. We didn't have a full understanding. We didn't implement it the right way. We added two things, so many things, and it got, became so complicated and so difficult. And, 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 and the Scripture tells us at the end of that Sermon on the Mount that when they pondered what Jesus had said, they were blown away. They were amazed. They were shocked. Because he spoke with one who had authority. You see, you have to have authority to say the things that he was saying. You've heard that it was said. This is what the law says, but I tell you. To say that means that he was teaching with authority. And that was unlike anything they had ever heard or witnessed before. And so he taught with authority. And, and, and then last week we also looked at a... Uh, particular uh, story that we're going to come back to this morning. But this morning, I want to kind of set the tone before we dive into the scripture. And, and I'm going to ask you a question. We talk about this a lot because it bothers me a lot. Do you ever wonder why more people don't go to church? Is that something that you think about? Pastors think about that a lot. Okay, we really do. Uh, because when I look at the numbers of people that are in this county and the numbers of people who attend church regularly, it kind of blows my mind. 
Uh, it's been a while since I've actually looked at the hard numbers, but uh, it's something like three to 4,000 people of the 22,000 who live in this county regularly attend church. If you didn't know that, that's, that's where we're at. Okay, so there's way more people who do not attend church than do. And so my question for you is, why? Why do you think that is? I mean, think about it for just a moment. <laughs> I mean, those of you who are saved, those of you who are Christians, those of you who are longtime church uh, members and church attenders, some of you guys may be here for the first time in a long time today. We're so, so glad you're here. But for those of you that do come all the time, I mean, think about what we have. Think about what we have to offer. I mean, there's not anything I face during my day that my Lord is not with me. There's not anything that I come up against that I cannot call upon him, that I can't, he, he promised he would never leave me, never forsake me. He's always there. I can pray to him. He gives me, he gives me a guide for living. He gives, me, he gives me focus. He's got a team of people that surround me that I can turn to if anything bad happens. I just, they're just a phone call or a text message away. I have all these friends who are also fellow believers that will surround me, lift me up, and hold me up. And when it's all said and done, <laughs> I don't, I'm not afraid to die. It does not scare me. Okay, the process may be a little bit confusing. I don't know how it's going to be. I don't like to hurt, but I can tell you this, on the other side of death, it's just a shadow. I'm going to live forever in eternity with him. I know that. It's a promise that he's going to make. I've accepted him, and, I, and he is my Lord and my Savior, and he has given me victory over death, and I'm not afraid. So I tell you, those of you who have that, those of you who can, who, who can, can communicate and can hear what I'm saying when I say those things, why well, would not everyone want to live that way? I've been to funerals of non-believers. It's no fun. It's horrible. It's a horrible dark place because it's, it's, nobody knows. Nobody understands. Nobody knows what happens on the other side. But when I go to, the, to a Christian funeral of a person who's been a, a baptized believer and, and, and has been, been a per, par, part of the church, for it, it's, it's a celebration. Sometimes you, you think, is this really a funeral home? I mean, we're laughing and talking and talking about all these things. Yeah, they lived to be 85 years old, and now they're living forever in eternity. And it's like, hey, great. You know, that's awesome. But you go into a place where somebody's not a believer and nobody in their family is, man, it's awful. It's weeping. It's dark. It's, there's no laughter. There's no celebration. It's lostness. And so you look around and think, my gosh, 17,000 people in this county don't come to church. Why? Why in the world would they not want to come? Why would they not want to believe? Why would they not want to be a part of that and not have that fear? Well, here's my theory. Okay, I believe we can do something to change that, but I, but I want you to understand something. I believe that most unchurched people... Because here's the thing, we believe in missions and we, 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 we uh, are a missions church. There are places in this world that you can go into and that you can tell them about Jesus. I remember George Chen telling me one time that they knocked on a door somewhere and I think it was in South America and he shared the gospel uh, with this lady and she looked at him with tears in her eyes and said, I've been waiting my whole life for somebody to tell me that. I want, I want him. I want to accept Christ, Okay. Because you can go into foreign countries, you can go into places where you can tell people, they, they don't even know where a church is, okay? They don't even know where a church is. Listen, how many churches did you drive past to get here this morning, okay? Some of y'all live close, but I know where some of you. How many churches did you drive past to get here, okay? We'd pass several, don't we, okay? Sure. We got them everywhere. We've got them everywhere. Why don't we all go? Why aren't we all a part of it? You see, there's a lot of folks in this county that I would consider to be unchurched or de-churched. They went to church at one time. And my theory is that a lot of them don't attend. And here's the reason. It's the result of church people. Or people who call themselves the church. Okay? That's why they don't come. Okay? That's why they don't come. I know because I've talked to them. I know because I have grown up with them. I know because I watched things happen that caused them not to come back. I've seen it, lived it, watched it, witnessed it. Many people have encountered what I consider to be bad situations before they encountered Christ. And let me tell you something. It's a tragedy. And it's really hard to undo. It is really hard to undo. I do believe that it is a challenge that we face. And I believe that we have to understand that we need to be warned 
of allowing it to happen. Because I don't believe that to be the case at Living Faith. I really don't. Some of you guys are new here, and you understand when you come here, you feel loved. When you come here, you feel welcomed. When you come here, you feel like it's a place where you can belong. It's a place, it's a group of people that you feel like you can hang out with, even before you understand what we believe. And that's what it's supposed to be, okay? Nobody comes in and says, this is what you need to wear, and this is where you need to sit, and this is how you need to behave, and I know where you were last week, okay? And more on that in just a moment. Folks, the problem that I'm talking about is legalism. The problem that I'm talking about is legalism and self-proclaimed Pharisees that are found within the church. And we've been talking about how Jesus confronted the Pharisees of his day, the actual Pharisees from the temple. And, and, and this is what I want to help you, and this is what I want to illustrate. Last week we kind of briefly touched on this passage, but today I want to take you further into an idea. I want to take you further into the true heart of what Jesus came to do. We looked at the teaching of the law, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and as we looked at that, we discovered that God's true intent was more about the matters of the heart than it is about the manifestations of the physical. Because, because this is what Jesus is saying. You've heard that it, that it was said long ago that you shouldn't kill anybody. Yep, never murdered anybody. Check the box. And he's like, let's check the heart. Let's check the heart. Who do you hate? Who gets under your skin? Who do you not like? It's more to it than that. You've heard that it was said long ago not to commit adultery. Check the box. Who you been looking at? What have you been looking at? What's her name? What's his name? It's about the heart, folks. This is what he drove home in the Sermon on the Mount. He was like, look, it's further than that. It's deeper than that. It's more than that. It's wrong to hate. On another instance, we, 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 we dug into this a little bit last week in Matthew, but I want to take you to Mark because there's another comment that Mark records, uh, and I think Mark basically kind of gives his story of what Peter encountered, and I think this is something that really grabbed Peter, and, and I think this is something that, that they heard him say and, and that it was just cuts right to the heart. And, and I want to take you back and set the context for the story. It's Mark chapter 2 and verse 23. Uh, this is where it happened, and we talked about this last week, but I want to take you one step further. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they were hungry, and they picked some of the grain heads to eat. Now, wherever Jesus went, there were crowds. Wherever Jesus went, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law and the other scribes and all these people who followed him along trying to catch him, okay, trying to get something. And so he's going through, the guys are hungry, they're eating something, and, and all of a sudden, the Pharisees... See this, and, and here's the thing. What does the law say? To remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, right? Did you know <laughs> that they took that and they come up with the most unbelievable list of things that you can do and that you can't do, okay? I mean, come on, how many of you ever heard of the ox in the ditch, right? Okay? Yeah, I had an ox in the ditch last Sunday. I had cows in mud up to their belly, so I went out and scraped the place off so they could stand on their feet, right? Okay, this is what he's saying. The Pharisees said to him, look, look, look what you're doing. It's unlawful on the Sabbath. You're, you're harvesting grain. You're working on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, oh, come on. Come on, guys. And he, he goes back and tells them the story that we shared last week about David and the temple. And he goes on. And then finally he just gives, he just unloads on them. And, and this is what he tells them. 227. This is what he says. Mark 227. The Sabbath was made for man. Not the other way around. You guys are in love with your rules. You're in love with your law. Come on. Remember the Sabbath day was for you. Okay? I've worked seven days a week. I do it a lot. I get tired. God says, you need to slow down. You need to take some time. You need a Sabbath. You know why? Not because I'm just... You know, not because I don't want you to walk too far on Sunday, <laughs> okay? Not because I don't want you to do that. Sabbath is Saturday anyway. The Jewish Sabbath is not even Sunday. We celebrate the Lord's Day. We celebrate Resurrection Day. So when is your Sabbath? He said, this is made for you. I gave this to you because, look, if you don't take time and remember me, your whole life will get turned upside down. If you don't take time to rest and you don't take time to, 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 to focus some time and worship me, and, and keep your relationship with me strong, 
Your whole life will unravel. I know. So I gave it for you. And you guys have got the whole thing turned around. You see, because here's the thing. Jesus is looking at them and saying, you got it all backwards. God is not more concerned about the Sabbath than he is about his people. You guys are more concerned about your law than you are about the people. They believe God was more concerned for his law than he was for his children. And why? Because they did. They did. Aha! We caught you. Red-handed. Breaking one of our laws. Breaking God's law. You know, it's not even what he intended. It's not even what he was talking about. And this is what, and this is why I say so many people have had a bad church experience because so many people fall in love with their religion. They fall in love with their religion. And then all of a sudden it becomes more about the building and the color of the carpet. That's why we just have some good old concrete, you know? I don't care. All right? It becomes more about the building. It becomes more about the color of the carpet. It becomes more about the stained glass in the windows. It becomes more about those things than it does about the people who are coming. And people just look at that and say, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for all that crazy. You know? When you come in and somebody's sitting in your seat, oh, no. Listen, guys, you sit anywhere you like, okay? Now, we'll explain that the front row is always open, okay? <laughs> All right? But in living faith, it's, it's wherever you want to be, okay? Nobody's got their name on a chair here. Legalism is what this means. Legalism prioritizes law over people. It always prioritizes a view over you, Okay? I've never shared this before, but I decided to, and I asked Sandy's permission. When Sandy was 18, her dad left, okay? When she was 18, she was the youngest uh, girl of three sisters, and she has a younger brother. And so when she was 18 years old and her brother was 16, their dad left, their mom. And it was a really bad divorce. Of course, this was back several years ago. Uh, and he left and had nothing to do with his family. Okay, now I'll just fast forward right now. He lives at Beaver Dam Nursing Home. He has lots of health problems, and we take care of all of his affairs and his business and, and, and take care of him. But, but I can just tell you that that will leave a mark on your children. When we got married, we went and told her mom, and we went and told her dad, and we asked if he would like to participate and be a part of the wedding ceremony, and he declined that invitation. He did not come and give his daughter away at her wedding. That's hard, folks. Okay? Daddies, let me just tell you, it's a bad decision. All right? That's a bad decision. And it'll leave a mark on you and leave a mark on your kids your whole life. You can't undo it. That was his call. Well, her mom was really just kind of a, a remarkable lady. And she did everything that she could to uh, overcome uh, that time in her life. And she continued to work. She worked for GE. She was very successful, had a great successful career. She saved money. She paid off her house. She did all the things that she needed to do. And then later in life, uh, several years after the divorce, she uh, met a gentleman by the name of Hubert Patterson. Everybody called him Pat because his last name was Patterson. Uh, he had like 13 brothers. Uh, and so when everybody got together for family reunion, he's like, hey, Pat, how you doing, Pat? Hey, Pat. And so everybody called him Pat. And, and he was just a great guy. And so they decided, they fell in love and decided to get married. This was a year before Sandy and I got married. Right after we met, they decided to get married. Now, here's something that maybe you didn't know. If you didn't, we'll tell you. She was raised Catholic. Okay, Her mom uh, came from a Catholic family, has uh, 12 uh, brothers and sisters and very large family and were raised in Stanley uh, out in uh, uh, West uh, Davis County. And that's where her mom grew up. Uh, she grew up in the Catholic Church. And when she made the decision to remarry, she wanted to do things the right way And, and uh, before her and Pat uh, got together. And, and, and so they uh, went to her priest. And she sat down with her priest and said, I would like to marry Pat. And Pat was raised a Baptist. He was not a Catholic. 
And, and, and she said, we would like to get married, and we want to know what we have to do in order to get married in the church. And, you know, she explained that, you know, the divorce was not her idea. He just one day said, I'm leaving, and he left, and, and, and so here I am. And the priest is what he told her, okay? This is what he told her. You're going to have to have your marriage annulled. And she said, annulled? Well, it happened. <laughs> we were married for 20 years. I have four children. I love my kids. It happened. It's not, it didn't happen. I didn't want the divorce, but the divorce happened. But the marriage also happened, and the children are proof of that. And he said, well, in that case, if you don't want to have it annulled, it would be better for you and Pat to just cohabitate rather than be married. Yeah, yikes. More in love with the law than they cared about people. That's real. That happened. Okay? Seven years later, they got married. They got married at the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Owensboro. And we were there. Seven years later, after I accepted the, the call to the ministry, I'm preaching at Brooklyn Baptist Church, and her mom and Pat came over to visit. When I gave the invitation, <laughs> and we're playing the piano in the old country church there at Brooklyn, and I'm standing down in front of the, of the pulpit, and I look up, and here comes my mother-in-law walking the aisle. She walked up. She took me by the hand. And I looked her right in the eyes, and this is what she said. I'll never forget it as long as I probably told several of you this, but this is what she told me. She said, I want what you have. And you know what that was? A real relationship with God. She had been raised in the Catholic Church, and she had been taught to do all those things that she was supposed to do, and she had done all of those things. But at the end of the time, she knew that she had fallen in love with someone. She knew that she had had children. And she knew that that was real. And that she did not ask for what happened. And she did not want it to happen. But yet it happened. And she wanted to do the right thing and be the right kind of person and move on with her life. And was told, no. We care more about the law than we do about you. And I introduced her to a Jesus who loved her for who she was and where she was. And would forgive her of whatever was in her past. And she could be free. And, she could, and, and here's the thing. She introduced Sandy and I to the Emmaus community. And, and, and she, she understood and she had a real relationship with God until the day he called her home. And she was ready to be with him. She was ready to be in his presence. And, and I know that's where she is today. I know that is where she is today, and I can be so thankful for that. But listen, folks, so many people, so many people have encountered the same kind of situation where, where somebody values their religion over the individual. You see, the people that Jesus encountered in this time loved the temple. They loved it. And, and this was the thing that, that, that was that when he spoke these words and, and when he told them this, uh, we looked at this last week, that, that Matthew's account uh, of this same event, uh, when, when these Pharisees were like, aha, we caught you, you know, because this is the law and this is all these things. And Jesus looked at them, and in Matthew 12, 6, this is what he told them. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. How can that be? How is that possible, Jesus? How is that possible? Have you seen the temple? Okay. There is nothing greater than the temple. These people loved their temple. They loved their law. What could possibly be greater than the temple? In AD 37, Caligula became the emperor of Rome. The first six months of his reign was pretty normal. And after that, he kind of slipped off the deep end, okay? There was, and I'm not reading from Scripture. I'm reading from history because you can go back and fact check it all you want. He was real and he existed. And, 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 and Caligula uh, was, was, a, uh, was just a, a crazy. And, and he, sexual immorality, and it goes on and on and on. And this is what he decided he was going to do, okay? He wanted a statue of himself placed inside of the Jewish temple. He wanted a statue of himself 
placed inside of the Jewish temple. So he had it made, he put it on a boat, and he sent it to Israel. And then he called on the leader of one of the Roman legions who was in the area, Petronius. And he said, I want you to come to the port city where my statue arrives, and I want you to accompany the statue to the temple and install it inside of the temple. So Petronius takes the Roman army, and he comes to the port city, and he receives the statue. And when he did, and news began to spread over all of, all of Judea, what was taking place, that the statue of Caligula was being taken to the temple. The, the farmers quit working, everybody left their homes, and they came by the thousands to the port city. And this is what they told Petronius. Please, do not disgrace our temple. The law says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is idolatry. We cannot allow this statue in our temple. And they bared their necks. This was a peaceful demonstration. This was not an attack. They bared their necks by the tens of thousands of Jews and said, before you will place the statue in our temple, you'll have to kill us all. And Petronius was perplexed. <laughs> this was genocide. He would have to murder thousands of Jews on his way to take this statue to the temple. And he thought this was nonsense. And so he, a, a Roman soldier, the leader of a legion, sent a letter to Caligula and said, I need some help. I need to know what you really want me to do. Now listen, for a Roman soldier to do that to the emperor was a death sentence because he would have just said slaughter them all and do what I told you to do. In the process of the letter being transmitted, it was the end of Caligula's rule because the Roman Senate and the people realized how crazy and off his rocker they was and they, they had him assassinated and the crisis was averted. Listen, folks, you can fact check this. This happened. This happened, and, 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 and they did it because they loved the temple that much. They were willing to just stop what they were doing and leave their fields and leave their homes and come out onto a dusty road and say, look, just kill me here. Before you take a statue like that into our temple, just kill us all. That is how much they loved the temple. And Jesus said something greater than the temple is here. And we may just pass by that. We may just flip that page, but that was, that, was, that was like, what are you saying? What are you saying? What can possibly be greater than the temple? What can be? Hmm. 20 years before Jesus shows up on the planet, the temple was restored to its former glory by King Herod. And the entire temple, this is one of the great, this is what made it just a, an incredible wonder of the uh, ancient world was the, the architecture and the design of this. It was all built of cut stone, okay? When I carry a concrete block, it kind of wears me out, okay? Some of these stones weighed 500 tons. This thing is massive. It's so massive. As a matter of fact, Mark records a, a moment when Jesus is in the temple as, as he's there teaching. And, and, and Mark 13 uh, verse 1 uh, says this. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Wow, can you believe this place, Jesus? I mean, look at this place. What massive stones. How did they do this? How did they build this? What magnificent buildings. This is. And this is what Jesus says. Do you see all these great buildings? I'm here to tell you. Not one stone. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. <laughs> it's a tear down. What are you saying, Jesus? What are you saying? This is, I mean, look how massive this place is. There's only one force on the planet that is capable of destroying this temple, and that is the Roman army. 
And they would never do that because, because they allowed Herod to build it so they could keep peace and occupy our land. Every stone would be thrown down. A.D. 70, 40 years later, the Jews attacked a Roman legion and had a victory and became very bold. And Rome decided to put an end to the uprising. I read to you from part of the account of the attack by Josephus. While the temple was ablaze, the attackers plundered it and countless people who were caught by them, were slaughtered. There was no pity for age, no regard was according, uh, accorded rank. Children, old men, laymen, priests alike, all butchered. Every class was pursued and crushed in the grip of war, whether they cried out for mercy or offered resistance. And through the roar of the flames, streaming far and wide, the groans of the falling victims were heard. Such was the height of the hill and the magnitude of the blazing pile that the entire city seemed to be ablaze. And the noise, nothing more deafening and frightening could be imagined. They burned everything that would burn. And after that... <laughs> They pushed the whole thing off the plaza into the valley below. You can go there today and still see some of the stones. Every stone will be thrown down. It's all gone. The end of ancient Judaism died in A.D. 70. The Roman army shoved the whole thing off the hill. But Jesus said, Something greater than the temple is here. Now, one thing about that, you can go back and read in history about the Roman siege of the temple and the destruction of the temple. It's real. It happened. It's just there. The question is, is that why isn't it here? Why did the gospel writers not include that in their writings? I mean, there were other things that Jesus said, and then they would say, well, at the time that he said it, we didn't understand it, but now we do. Okay? Things that he said before the resurrection, and then the things that he said after the resurrection, we put the two things together, and we understand. This was a prophecy that he flat out said, look, not one stone will be left. They will all be thrown down. Why would they not include that in their writings? I'm going to tell you why I don't think they included it. Because it hadn't happened yet. When Mark was written... Hadn't happened. When Matthew recorded what he did, it hadn't happened. You see, there's a lot of kids who go to, to college, and, and, and when they go to college, their professors say, Why would you believe this book? Because it was written, you know, hundreds of years after Jesus by other people who weren't eyewitnesses and weren't there. I call baloney. Okay? All right? I, I say that, that, that this was written before that time by eyewitnesses, by people who were there. Luke said, I carefully researched everything in this book, but he did not record the destruction of the temple. Why? Because it hadn't happened when he wrote Luke. That ought to make everybody sit up straight and say, wow. Because when Jesus said it was going to happen, it happened exactly the way he said that it would. And we saw it. We have it recorded in our history books. Something greater than the temple is here. Something greater. Right there in the temple, Jesus makes a very powerful statement in a situation that occurred that John recorded uh, in his 8th chapter, uh, beginning with verse 1. This is what John says happened. <laughs> Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and afterwards he... Uh, appeared again in the temple courts, and he would teach in the temple itself. And where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And, and, and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. She broke the law. They made her stand before the group. They drug this poor woman right in there, and, and, and they brought her right up before Jesus. And here they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Okay? 
The law of Moses, you've heard that it was said long ago, (laughs) commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? What do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. We don't know what he wrote. And they kept on questioning him. He straightened up and this is what he said to them. Okay. Well then. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And so he stooped back down again, and he began to write. (laughs) At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now look at this. The finger of God. The finger of God who gave the law to Moses was the same finger that was writing on the ground. We don't know what he wrote, but it was the same finger. And he said, thou shalt not commit adultery. And here stood somebody in front of him who had been caught red-handed in the act. I don't know where the guy was because it takes two, okay? But they brought her. And this is what he said to her. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now. And this is important, folks. Okay? Because he did not come to abolish the law. He did not stand before this woman and say, Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Live the way you want to live. That's not what he said. He said, Look, sweetie, go now and leave your life of sin. I love you more than I love you the law okay i love you more than i love the law the sin that you've committed has has put a separation between you and i guess what i'm gonna go die for it there has to be a price paid for what you've done wrong i'm gonna pay it i'm gonna give my life for your sin but i need you to stop i need you to quit because it's destroying your life sin destroys you Satan comes to, to seek and he comes to, to, to kill and destroy. And, and that list of things that I gave you is not for me, just to so that you can have a miserable life, <laughs> okay? Just so that I can keep you from having fun. It's destroying your, your life. It's destroying your marriage. I want what's best for you. I care about you. I love you. The Sabbath was made for you because I want you to love me. I want you to take time. I want you to rest. You can't love people if you hate them. You know, it's, it's one thing to, to kill somebody, but it's another thing. You can't, how can you love them and share them the, the love that I have for you if you don't like them? How can you live that way? You see, it's not about the law and elevating it above relationship. Listen, that's what has destroyed the church. That's, what, that's, what, that's why we have set more people by the thousands who are unchurched than we have churched. Because we've done too much of this. Okay? Listen, last Monday night, John Abney came here and shared a powerful testimony. Because he had basis, okay, for divorce in his life. But he chose forgiveness and he chose reconciliation. But one thing that struck me to the core As he said, well, I was going through that. I felt alone and abandoned. Listen, he should should have had a church around him instead of a church saying, okay. Listen, ladies, I don't know if you've ever been to a wow, but you need to come tomorrow night, okay. And you need to listen to his wife's testimony and leave your stones at home, okay. Because that's what forgiveness is about. It's what reconciliation is about, and it's what God is about. He wants you to have a good life. He wants you to enjoy this life here because he came that you might have life and have it to the full. And when he looks at sin in your life, he says, look, you need to quit because it's destroying your life. 
Yeah, but it's fun, but it won't be for long because I know the destructive nature of it. Maybe you don't. See, there's so many things that we can get away with. He's like, look, you don't understand. I I came to die for you. And I want to love you. And and when people begin to have a heart for those that are around us, instead of looking down our nose at them, (laughs) that's what the church is about. And I'm going to tell you, there are thousands of people in this county who are not here today because of how they've been treated or how they've been perceived or how they've seen other people treated. And it has to stop. It has to stop. It's not why Jesus came. He looks at us and says, look, <laughs> come on. I, you know, when, when you, if you're doing the wrong thing, when it, just like this woman, you're, you're doing the wrong thing, honey, but it's tearing your life apart. And you've got to quit. You've got to repent and quit that. You've got to stop. You know, when you, if, you, if you decide that you're going to move in with somebody and you're living with somebody, it's like, look, you say, people will look and say, oh, well, they're all shacking up. J- Jesus looks at it and says, look, I want you to be committed to each other. I don't want in two or three years somebody to say, well, we're not really married, so I'll just walk away. And, and then your life gets torn apart. He says, look, I want you to be committed. And love. I want you to have a happy, united marriage. It's not because I don't want you to have any fun. I want you to have a good life together. So when we see that situation, we don't need to shun and say, oh, that's terrible. We look at that situation and pray for it. And, and we have to develop a relationship with somebody so that we can come alongside them and say, look, I love you. I'm concerned about you. I, I, want, you, I want you to see something because I'm, I'm concerned about you. Because I have, you, you have to have a relationship to do that. That has to be, that has to be cultivated. It takes time. And if you don't have the relationship, just pray. Just pray and welcome. Come on in because Jesus is pretty powerful. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. He convicts and he, and he, and he does amazing things. And we need to let him do his work. Okay? That's why the Bible says, that's why Jesus says don't judge until you get the log out of your own eye. So that you can see clearly. So that you can come alongside someone. Until that time comes, just pray. Just pray for them because we have so many people that are tearing their lives apart and doing things that are destructive that need to repent and they need to turn and they need to come back to God. He says to us what he said to the woman. Leave your life of sin. Do it the right way. I want what is best for you. We have to trust him in that. We have to trust him in that. He didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to give us a license to sin. But he came and he reduced all of those laws. He first reduced it to two. What is the greatest commandment, Jesus? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he got down to the end. He's like, you know, I think that's too complicated. (laughs) These people are going to forget that. Come on, guys, listen to me. A new command I give you. Love one another. Just start there. Get that right. If you'll get that right... Let me take care of the rest. Let the Holy Spirit in people's lives take care of the rest. If you'll just show them my love because I died for their sin. I don't care what it is. I didn't die for it. I gave my life for it. They can be forgiven of it no matter how bad it is. You just love them until they figure it out. Love them until they figure it out. Love them until you have a relationship so that you can come alongside of them and say, Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? What do you need to let go of? Who do you need to come alongside? Who do you need to invite? Listen, I'm not going to tell you it's easy. We've had so much destructive behavior that has taken place and torn so many people down. Uh, Sometimes pastors get really frustrated and we just look at people who are tearing people apart in churches and it's like, would you just stay home? Okay? It's like, oh, he's off. No, I don't care. Okay? Give me a chance, okay? You've got your ticket, all right? And so just punch it and go fishing, okay? If you're not going to behave right, just go somewhere else and give me a chance because they're going to hell. That's what we need to be concerned about. And we need to behave in such a way as that we are concerned about people who are lost and going to hell. Because it's real. It's real. And it's happening to so many people. And we need to be concerned about that. And Jesus said, love one another. Because they are lost. And they are going to hell. And if you will love them and accept them and invite them in, then I will take care of the rest. My Holy Spirit will convict them. They will come to an understanding. You're not giving them a license to sin. You're not telling them it's okay. Never do that. Never tell somebody it's okay. Just love them. Make them feel welcome. And let the Holy Spirit do His work. 
We need to let him do his work now. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for who you are. Father, we are so thankful that you loved us more than your law. Father, because uh, there's so many things except for your grace. I'm right there. Father, we thank you for your mercy. Father, I don't know where anyone is today, but you know where we all are. You know how we need to respond. You know what we need to do. You know the decisions we need to make. Help us. Help us to let go and just let you. Father, you love us so much. So much that you went to the cross and bled out and died for us. Father, help us to not look at others with accusing eyes, but to look at them with a lens of care and of love. Armed with your gospel and understanding, Father, that you have made a way. And then, Father, that we might carefully and gently guide those that we care and love for so that they might have what we have. A life-saving relationship with you. Father, I pray this morning as we just reflect and respond to what you've shared with us this morning. Help us to respond in the best way. In the way you would have us. And Father, if that means we need to let something go. And we need to turn from a, something in our life, Father. And give that to you. Father, help us to do that in a way that we understand that you love us. You want what's best for us. You have come that we may have life and have it to the full. And Father, for all those of us that have been saved for a long time, help us to love with your love. Help us to accept with your acceptance. Help us to pray for those who need it. Help us to just, just be a light, Father, in their lives. And that this might be a church that is a lighthouse on a hill that people feel welcome to come. Not judged, not looked down upon, but, but a place of rescue. A place that, uh, of caring and nurturing and healing. Father, that's what the church is supposed to be about. A place that radiates your love and your forgiveness. Praying for repentance for those who need it and those who come. And Father, we all have sin. All of us stand guilty. All of us need to repent. All of us need to turn, Father, and come to you. Oh, receive a double dose of your mercy and grace that we might go and share it with the lost world. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would guide us in a time of invitation. Help us to respond, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Please stand.